Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 7 for our MCAT physics and math playlist. And this chapter is titled Waves and Sound. In this chapter, we're going to cover two main objectives. Our first objective is to explore general wave characteristics. So this section will go over transverse and longitudinal waves, key properties like amplitude, frequency, and phase. We'll also cover the superposition principle and the behavior of traveling and standing waves. And then we're going to end this section with a discussion on resonance and its role in amplifying wave motion. From there, we're going to shift our focus to the second objective, which is titled sound. This section explores sound as an application of wave mechanics. And here we're going to cover how vibrations produce sound. We're also going to cover the relationship between frequency and pitch and amplitude and loudness. Then we will discuss the role of standing waves in musical instruments and the practical use of ultrasound. With that introduction, let's go ahead and get started with objective one. Let's begin with discussing sinusoidal waves. This is a type of periodic wave that follows the shape of a sine curve. The term sinusoidal refers to the smooth repetitive oscillation pattern that mirrors the mathematical sine function. These waves are fundamental in physics because they describe many natural phenomena from the movement of sound waves to the oscillations of light and water waves. Now, sinusoidal waves, they can take two primary forms, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. And although both involve particles oscillating back and forth, the difference lies in the direction of particle motion relative to the wave's propagation. In a transverse wave, the particles of the medium oscillate perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling. So you can think of the motion as moving up and down while the wave travels horizontally. This type of wave is common in systems like electromagnetic waves, where electric and magnetic fields oscillate perpendicularly to the direction the wave propagates. Additionally, surface waves on water will also follow this transverse motion, with the water particles moving up and down while the wave itself travels forward. Now let's compare this to longitudinal waves. In these waves, the particles oscillate parallel to the direction of wave propagation. This means that as the wave moves forward, the particles compress and stretch along the same axis. A familiar example of a longitudinal wave is sound, where air molecules oscillate back and forth in the same direction that the sound wave travels. So in this diagram, you see that waves create alternating regions where the particles are pushed closer together and regions where the particles are spread apart. And this movement is essential for transmitting energy through mediums like air, water, or even solids. Now, despite their differences, both transverse and longitudinal waves share many characteristics and they follow similar principles. They each have measurable properties such as wavelength, frequency, and amplitude, which we're going to explore next. The wavelength, denoted as lambda, is the distance between two consecutive points that are in phase, such as two crests or two troughs in a wave. It tells us how long each cycle of the wave is along its path. So a shorter wavelength means that the wave cycles more frequently over a given distance, while a longer wavelength indicates that the cycles are spread further apart. This measurement is important because it helps us determine how energy is transmitted across space through waves. Now, the frequency of a wave, denoted as F, 
measures how many complete wave cycles pass a fixed point in a given amount of time. Frequency is measured in hertz, where one hertz is equal to one cycle per second. Now from these two values, we can calculate the propagation speed of a wave. The propagation speed of a wave is equal to frequency multiplied by wavelength. Now to elaborate on frequency a little bit, if we have 10 cycles of a wave that pass by every second, the frequency is going to be equal to 10 hertz. And frequency is closely tied to period. This is denoted as capital T. And this is the amount of time it takes for one complete cycle to occur. Mathematically, the period is the inverse of frequency. So it's expressed as one over frequency. And this inverse relationship highlights how higher frequency waves complete more cycles in less time, resulting in shorter periods. Now another important parameter is the angular frequency. This is denoted as W, and this offers another way to measure how quickly the wave oscillates. Angular frequency relates to regular frequency by this equation right here. Angular frequency is equal to two pi multiplied by frequency. Alternatively, we can also write that angular frequency is equal to two pi divided by the period. Now, this equation is really useful when analyzing waves that involve circular motion or periodic systems because it provides the rate of rotation in radians per second. Now finally, we want to talk about amplitude. This measures the maximum displacement of particles from their equilibrium position. So in a graph of a wave, the amplitude corresponds to the height of the crests or the depth of the troughs. The greater the amplitude, the more energy the wave carries. In practical terms, larger amplitudes often result in more noticeable effects, such as louder sounds in the case of sound waves or brighter light in the case of electromagnetic waves. Now, when we're analyzing waves that pass through the same space, it becomes important to describe how the waves align with one another. This alignment, or lack thereof, is expressed through the concept of phase difference. Phase tells us whether two waves are in step or out of step as they propagate. When two waves are perfectly aligned, meaning their peaks and troughs occur at the same points, they're said to be in phase. On the other hand, when the peaks of one wave align with the troughs of another, the waves are considered out of phase. Understanding phase difference allows us to predict how these waves will interact with each other. And this interaction between waves leads us to the principle of superposition, which explains how waves combine. According to the principle of superposition, when two or more waves overlap, the displacement of the resultant wave at any point is the sum of the displacements of the interacting waves at that same point. In other words, the waves do not cancel or replace one another. Instead, they add together to produce a new wave pattern. Depending on the waves and how they align, two types of interference can occur, constructive interference and destructive interference. Constructive interference happens when two waves that are in phase overlap. This results in a new wave with a larger amplitude than either of the original waves, meaning that the energy of the wave is amplified. Constructive interference is the reason why sounds can seem louder when multiple sound waves align or why bright spots appear in light interference patterns. 
On the other hand, destructive interference occurs when waves that are out of phase overlap. In this case, the peak of one wave aligns with the trough of another, leading to partial or complete cancellation of the wave's displacement. As a result, the amplitude of the resultant wave is reduced or in some cases brought to zero. Destructive interference helps explain phenomena like noise-canceling headphones, where sound waves are deliberately out of phase with ambient noise to reduce or eliminate unwanted sounds. Now, if the two waves are not perfectly in phase or out of phase, meaning their peaks and troughs don't perfectly align, then we get a mix of constructive and destructive interference, and this leads to complex wave patterns. The resulting wave's amplitude would fall somewhere between the sum and the difference of the two interacting waves. Now, what makes sense to talk about next is standing and traveling waves. Let's start with traveling waves. A traveling wave is a wave that moves continuously through a medium, transferring energy along its path. So for example, if a string is fixed at one end and then the other end is moved up and down, a wave will propagate along the string towards that fixed boundary. When the wave reaches this boundary, it's gonna be reflected back along the string with its phase inverted. If the free end of the string is moved repeatedly, then we're gonna have two waves that are gonna be present. You're gonna have your original traveling wave that's moving towards the boundary, and then you're gonna have your reflected wave traveling back from the boundary. As these two waves interact, they interfere with one another and they create patterns that depend on their relative phases. In contrast to traveling waves, a standing wave forms when two waves of the same frequency and amplitude travel in opposite directions and interfere constructively and destructively at different points. Unlike traveling waves, standing waves do not transfer energy across space, but they do oscillate in place. They seem to stay in place with only specific points along the medium moving up and down in amplitude. Now, when a string is fixed at both ends, standing waves form when certain frequencies make the reflected wave align with the incoming wave, and that creates a stable pattern like you see here. This also creates nodes where the string doesn't move and anti-nodes where the amplitude is at its highest. Similarly, standing waves can form in pipes open at both ends, following the same principles. The connection between the length of the string or the pipe and the wavelength of the standing wave is really key to understanding how these resonant systems work. And we're actually gonna explore that further in objective two. Since we are on the topic, standing waves, they play an essential role in musical instruments. Specifically, standing waves are essential in musical instruments where vibrating strings or air columns create harmonic patterns that produce distinct sounds. These instruments rely on their ability to resonate at specific frequencies and that brings up the topic of natural frequency and resonance. Every object has a natural frequency. This is the frequency at which it naturally oscillates when disturbed. And this depends on factors like the object's size, shape, and material. So for example, guitar strings, they vibrate at specific frequencies that correspond to the notes we hear. And when a periodic force matches an object's natural frequency, the oscillation amplitude increases dramatically, and this effect is called resonance. Resonance explains why instruments or even a half-filled wine glass produces clear tones when played or struck. 
When the force, whether from plucking a string or tapping the glass, matches the object's natural frequency, the sound amplifies. Now, everyday objects like pencils or chairs, they don't exhibit noticeable resonance because their natural frequencies don't align with typical environmental forces. Now, at the resonant frequency, the amplitude of oscillation peaks, but in real systems, this growth doesn't continue indefinitely. Damping caused by friction, air resistance, or internal material constraints gradually reduces the amplitude, preventing uncontrolled vibration. And this is good because without damping, oscillating objects like bridges, buildings, or instruments could vibrate uncontrollably. And this balance between resonance and damping is very much essential for stability. And with that, we've completed objective one. We're going to go ahead and stop the video here. In the next video, we'll pick up on objective two. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns so far. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.